myself. I'm Eileen Guadalupe, third-year resident. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, retinal pigment epithelial tears. Um, I know this is a topic that really uh, excites everyone, as I can tell by the turnout this morning. Uh, so I thought I'd throw in some uh, travel photos. Um, I recently got to go to Japan. Uh, my cousin had been a corporate lawyer for many years, and even though we're Chinese, she speaks Chinese, Japanese, and English uh, fluently. But she recently quit her job as a corporate lawyer to work at the front desk of a hotel in a ski-in, ski-out resort on the main island uh, of Japan. So this is a photo from uh, a uh, nearby ski resort, and you can actually see the ocean from there, theoretically. Um, so this is something I wanted to present um, at FA conference when I was on Retina, but I never got around to it because I kept getting assigned different other topics by the Retina faculty. So that might indicate to you how interesting this is to them as well. Okay, so this is a case. Um, it's a 45-year-old male. Um, he had uh, mildly distorted central vision in his left eye. He had a history of keratoconus uh, for which he wore soft contact lenses uh, dr and dry AMD. So on the exam, he was 20-25 in the right, 20-30 in the left. Uh, this was unchanged from baseline. Um, with refraction, he had um, a significant amount of, again, the roll sill. Uh, but this uh, refraction didn't improve his visual acuity or the distortion he was experiencing. Uh, on Amsler grid, it's a little hard to, oops, clicked the wrong thing. Um, you can see uh, he described a few squiggles here, centrally, in that left eye. On uh, slit lamp examination, uh, he had uh, keratoconus with both striae in both eyes. He had uh, moderate cataracts in both eyes. And on his dilated fundus examination, drusen and uh, pigment changes were noted in both eyes. Uh, so what further testing uh, would you like to get? I'll ask uh, Reese. Uh, macular CT. OK. Uh, any other testing that you'd like to get? Color fundus photos, autofluorescence. <laughs> OK. Uh, so he saw his uh, cornea specialist. So we got um, a topo. <laughs> Uh, and you can see inferior steepening in both eyes. Uh, but he also did get a macular OCT, uh, not all those other things you mentioned. Um, and you can see some uh, drusen in that right eye, and this is the left eye. Um, I'll ask the next resident that I can see to describe the OCT in the left eye, and that's Tara. And there's a pointer over oh, there, wow. too. detachment or PED just as Tara said um, so just you know to point out when there is hyporeflective stuff it usually corresponds to fluid and how do we tell that it's underneath the RPE so we have these you know two lines here this one's the ISOS junction here's the RPE and it's clear that the fluid is under uh, the RPE and you can kind of see um, the uh, posterior hyaloid face here and it's kind of attaching right at the fovea and kind of tenting it up a little bit. So a little bit of vitromacular attraction, as Tara said. And we'll move on once my computer decides. Okay, okay, here we go. Um, so I'd like to poll the audience and see uh, what you'd like to do next. Uh, here are the options, and uh, you could raise your hand with which one you want to go along with. Uh, so who wants to inject uh, him for anti vegf He's got you know, some central distortion. He's got this pigment epithelial detachment. Raise your hand if you want to do that. OK, no one wants to do that. How about observe? Who wants to observe? Okay, a lot of people want to observe. How about who wants to do a vitrectomy? You know, he's got that vitreo macular traction. Maybe you could fix him by uh, releasing that. Um, anyone? OK, seems like observing is pretty popular. And that is uh, what his retina specialist, Dr. Bernstein, decided to do. And we'll talk about the rationale for that later. Uh, and then he followed up again uh, four months later, uh, saying that uh, there are straight lines, like light poles uh, now have a wave to them, and that there's a spot in the middle of his vision that makes it hard to see. His visual acuity in that left eye has decreased from 2030 to 2060, and he's got a lot of squigglies, a lot more squigglies on his Amsler grid. 
Uh, so here's the uh, fundus photos from that visit. Uh, I'll call on the next resident that I see, is, which is Ashley. All right, so these are color fundus photos of both eyes and the right eye. You can see the soft bruising. Um, and some soft bruising and show up that well here but basically this round area is more yellow than uh, the rest of the fundus. Um, here's uh, the uh, next photos autofluorescence and infrared. I think Renee is the next resident that I see. Can you describe them please? Thank yeah, you. So you have an autofluorescent image of the left fundus and the left um, on the left here so you see the central area of hypo autofluorescence some surrounding areas and centrally also hyper autofluorescence and then this halo of hypo autofluorescence in that area you have your infrared image over here and basically you see hypo reflectivity good thank you um can, renee can you describe the octs as well yeah sure so i mean the first thing that you're seeing is this hypo reflective um area that's represented by the PED, and then you see some overlying intraretinal cysts as well. Yeah, yeah. Just in case you couldn't hear him, uh, this is a PED, and now there's some uh, cysts overlying it. Um, I don't want to call on Rick's because he's still getting a, a drink. How about back to Reese? Um, oh, Nico's back there. Okay. Uh, Nico, you're up. Uh, you can describe this fluorescent. In the uh, left lower corner, there's some early filling defects in the macular region. And then in the right lower corner, there seems to be late filling defects at like almost two minutes. <coughs> or, um, yeah. Is there hyperfluorescence as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there's this um, round area of uh, pulling of the dye that has discrete margins. Uh, there are some uh, hypofluorescent uh, areas corresponding to the pigment clumps, and maybe this area is kind of darker, and this area is a little brighter, so uh, could be a notch and hot spot. Uh, let's see, is Rick still getting a drink? Rick's, uh, is there anything notable on this ICG? So there's an area of uh, hyporeflectivity uh, to the superior macula. Uh, are you talking about these little guys or that? That big one. Yeah, this guy. I'm not sure, you know, how significant that is. Um, well, the main thing is we can see that the is on this ICG, the fundus details are obscured uh, in this area that kind of corresponds to where the <coughs> pigment epithelial detachment is. But it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't really uh, stain or leak. Uh, so the patient, um, was then uh, started on uh, a flipper sept based on the findings um, of the previous imaging. Uh, but on his visit for the third injection, uh, he hadn't noticed any uh, changes, but his visual acuity had actually decreased to 20 over 250 from 20 over 40. Eileen? Yeah. So in this patient with wet AMD, I guess what is the utility and the cost benefit of uh, ICG? I mean, if it's an African American patient, I think polypoidal, I can see that, but I guess I'm just unaware so, of the benefit. So, in this case, I think, um, you know, when you have a serous PED, as you see in this photo, um, I think that is a really good question. You know, we don't often get ICGs. Why did uh, Dr. Bernstein decide to get an ICG in this case? I can't read his mind, but he can speak for himself. But you know, one thing is that serous PEDs don't always correspond to wet AMD. They don't always correspond to neovascularization. They could just be, you know, kind of a degenerative change without choroidal neovascularization. Uh, and in those cases, um, uh, the ICG can, if there is hyperfluorescence, indicate that there is a CMB and you can see, you know, how big it is, et cetera. And then, you know, on this OCT, you know, those are probably intraretinal cysts, so this is probably 
classy of me, but I don't think it's so much fluid that it's so obvious that's definitely an active process. What's your thought? So the other things I would add is I would get it in these atypical AMD because they may be polypoidal. You talk about African Americans, but here in this population, I do see it in Caucasians. And so that could be different. We might use PDT, we might use focal laser. If I saw a hot spot sometimes, you see an extrafoveal hot spot on these things, and that you know, conventional laser or PDT can be useful. So thank you. Yep. But I'd say in this case, you know, <coughs> it wasn't super obvious that this is definitely active wet AMD. Um, all right, so uh, now we have his four month follow up where his vision has dropped in that left eye. Uh, Reese, can you describe the, this is a, his four month follow up and this is the previous visit. Do you see any differences in those photos? Um, so in the current picture on the left, there's, there's a little bit less yellow appearing syndrome but in the area of that piece maybe a little bit more hyperpigment in superior and then a little more atrophic inferior. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, difficult to appreciate. You can see the fundus details better here, and this area is darker. Um, next we have the autofluorescence, uh, and this is again the four-month follow-up visit and the previous visit. Tara? Um, so it looks like in the current picture there is With pretty um, sharp borders too. And here's uh, the OCT. This is actually a vertical uh, scan. Uh, Ashley, do you mind describing this? Sure. Uh, so again, we see that large PED, um, and at this point, you really have a large area of ISOS junction uh, drop out, and um, right lower, you're just going to Correct. Um, so the main uh, finding here is that you, you can see the RP here, and you can see the RP <coughs> here, uh, but there's uh, no, no really, not any RP present here, and you can see the choroid uh, in more detail because um, that RP is not reflecting the light. And this uh, RP is kind of scrolled up and scrunched up. Uh, so this is a retinal pigment epithelial tear, and that's what this patient was diagnosed with. Um, here's another photo. This is from the back side of the mountain. You can see that there are kind of a lot of ski resorts here. Some beautiful lakes and the trees are uh, mostly birch trees. So I'm going to uh, just give a little background on uh, pigment epithelial detachments and RPE tears, um, when they occur and uh, how they should be treated. Uh, so back to the uh, pigment epithelial detachments, uh, we talked about the serous PEDs as being, you know, they may or may not be a sign of um, choroidal neovascularization. And those are the ones that have more uniform filling with discrete edges. Uh, there's also fibrovascular PEDs, which on uh, fluorescein uh, have this stippled hyperfluorescence with late leakage. Uh, drusenoid PEDs, this is actually a photo of the patient's right eye that are more just a sign of confluent drusen, and they're definitely not a sign of choroidal neovascularization. And then uh, when you do have a serous PD, we talked about uh, trying to distinguish, you know, is it a sign of active choroidal neovascularization that needs to be treated? Um, if it is um, associated with CND, uh, it is treated with anti-VEGF. Uh, however, recent studies have shown uh, that the PEDs uh, get smaller with a flibber step compared to ranibizumab. However, uh, that doesn't necessarily correspond to better visual acuity uh, in these patients, but um, it might be a better idea if you're going to start uh, something to start a flibber set. Um, and then, how about those cases where, uh, like at this patient's first presentation, where he had the PED, but he didn't have any subretinal or intraretinal fluid on the OCT, so our suspicion that there was choroidal neovascularization was low. Um, it can still cause visual symptoms. Um, you know, he did have a little bit of central distortion. Maybe that was from this PED. Um, in the past, uh, they did do some studies where they treated these PEDs with grid laser, uh, even though they didn't show signs of CMV and there was no visual benefit, as you can imagine. Grid laser in the macula might not, for mild symptoms, might not be the best. Um, however, for anti-VEGF, I'm not aware of any studies that 
uh, tried to treat PEDs that were not associated with choroidal neovascularization. I think the reason for that is because you know there's risks and possibly uh, no benefits. So how about uh, retinal pigment epithelial tears like this patient had? So uh, they often occur in PEDs that have uh, CNB, um, and they're thought to be due to uh, contraction of the CNB as well as hydrostatic forces from the fluid within the PED. And they're characterized uh, by scrolling and retraction of that free RPE edge, and then an RPE free area uh, like we saw in our patient's imaging. So if we go back to the imaging, um, you can see that clearly on the OCT, and also uh, in the autofluorescence, this uh, very discrete uh, hypoautofluorescence area corresponds to a total lack of an RPE in that area. Uh, so the RPE normally has these floor floors like lipofusion, but there's none here. And it's kind of bunched up here, so it's a little more fluorescent. Uh, so what are the risk factors for tears? Uh, one of the uh, better studied ones is larger PEDs are more likely to tear. Uh, other things are, uh, it may be more common in serous PEDs than fibrovascular PEDs. And it usually occurs in occult without classic and hemorrhagic CNB. Uh, there are some uh, studies where they looked at the people who tore and looked at their imaging uh, before the tear. And uh, they found that some of them have uh, radial hyperreflective lines on the infrared. Uh, and they think that corresponds to the choroidal neovascular membrane kind of pulling traction on that surface of the RPE. Uh, another sign is non-homogeneous filling on the FA, uh, which our patient kind of had. And another sign would be leakage into the PED uh, on ICG. Uh, so in our patient, uh, he got the tear after getting uh, two injections. Uh, this is a pretty common pattern. Uh, tears uh, are most frequently seen in you know, the few months to uh, several months after the first injection. Uh, but do the injections cause the tears? Um, so this uh, was a study that looked at uh, the major clinical trials uh, that uh, were first done for ranibizumab. And uh, there were similar rates of tears in the injection group and in the control group, about two to three uh, percent. But the Median time to tear was uh, a lot sooner, three months in the injection group compared to 12 months in the control group. So uh, it's not clear to me whether uh, the injections cause tears, but they are more likely to happen after you uh, start injecting. It may just be that the uh, tear happens sooner um, if you inject. Uh, so visual prognosis. Uh, it's very variable. As you can imagine, if that RPE free zone is far from the fovea, uh, patients could have no uh, de decrement to their visual acuity. But if, like in this patient, uh, that RPE free area is right under his fovea, your vision can really drop dramatically uh, at the time of the tear. Um, over time, uh, patients uh, can experience a small gradual decline in their acuity and then uh, they can develop either a fibrotic scar or an atrophic area, and it, the fibrotic scars are uh, correlated with worse vision. Um, so how should these tears be treated? So there is a uh, possible thought that maybe the ejection might have caused the tear. However, uh, these patients probably do better off if you keep treating them uh, with injections to uh, dry up their fluid, um, although it hasn't been you know, studied in a very controlled manner. If you get it, if you get a tear that's thought to be from an injection, whether you should uh, observe or treat. But I think in general, uh, treating uh, is correlated with better outcomes. So uh, follow up in this case, uh, he continued to get monthly injections. Uh, his PED became a lot smaller. Uh, the subretinal fluid resolved, and his intraretinal cysts uh, mostly resolved. Uh, the central retina, as you can see here, uh, became. Uh, pretty atrophic. Um, he used to be an accountant and one of his complaints this whole time was that he has to use two computer monitors so uh, and it's very difficult for him. Um, so he retired from his accounting job and moved down to St. George where theoretically he might be seeing Dr. Jacoby or Dr. Teske. Um, his visual acuity uh, was uh, 2080 at his last visit here but he reported having some disabling uh, diplopia. So in conclusion, uh, pigment epithelial detachments um, 
when they occur without any uh, intraretinal or subretinal fluid, uh, they may not be a sign of wet AMD and they should probably be observed. So I see that everybody else was on the same page with that. And RP tears can be a pretty serious cause of vision loss in patients with AMD that have PEDs. Uh, on imaging, they generally demonstrate a bare area without RPE adjacent to an area with retracted uh, RPE. Uh, patients with large PEDs are more likely to get them, and they frequently occur after uh, a few anti-VEGF injections, but <coughs> continued injection uh, is probably helpful. Uh, so this is another picture from the top of that mountain. As you can see, the trees are really uh, close together in Japan, so that was exciting for skiing. <laughs> All right, uh, questions, comments, Dr. Zog? So your last line there, is that assuming that after the RPE tear you continue to treat? Correct. Okay. So uh, in the original trials that approved ranibizumab, like Marina, et cetera, uh, they looked at the patients that got tears in the injection group and the patients that got tears in the control group and the patients that got injections did better. So, and they continue to get injections after they got their tear. But I don't think that's really a perfect comparison since you know, the control group was getting no injections at all. You know, no wonder their vision was wor worse than the people who got injections. So. And they've looked at uh, retrospectively, um, you know, in modern times where everybody with it by AMD gets injected, uh, and the number of injections correlates with better visual acuity in people that have tears. But, you know, they could be being treated because their visual prognosis is better compared to the others. So I don't think that's proof either, but. Yeah, they, just to add, uh, there is still ne active neovascularization in that scrolled up RPE. So that's why you keep treating, at least to dry it out. We used to see these a lot too when we did photodynamic therapy. I mean, almost anything, you, these are just, when you see a patient like this, I tell them from the start, there's a risk that this may tear and you know, everything's, you know, you may lose your vision permanently centrally. It's a, it's a bad situation from the start. Right, yeah, they definitely, if they have active neurovascularization, they'll do better with injections than observation. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. thanks for the great presentation. I always wondered what the consequence of an RP terror was. Uh, one of my old retina attendings would always say, diplopia is better than no copia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.